Live from John Hammond Street in Kanda, this is News 360s coming to you from Adesa way here in Accra. My name is Alfred Okanse. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Top of the bulletin this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint. Heaven Insecticide Spray and Coil. Piccadilly Biscuits. And My Life Insurance. University of Ghana in today's Professor Ransford Jampo and Dr. Paul Kwame Butako indicted in BBC's Sex for Grades documentary. Also, spokesperson for the University Professor Audrey Gajapo, she's going to be joining us live in the studio on this. And vandals of the Commonwealth Hall of the University of Ghana issue seven-day ultimatum to government to address accommodation challenges on campus. Lecture halls at Kumasi Technical University deserted following strike by Technical University Teachers Association of Ghana, TUTAG. Business, British diplomat and chief executive officer of UK Africa Investment Summit says the UK will increase its investment in partnerships. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says Brexit deal suffers setbacks. Remember, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook or DSTV channel 279 and also on 3news.com. We go on to our first story. This evening, uh, the University of Ghana has interdicted two lecturers who were captured in the Sex for Great documentary by the BBC African Eye. Now, what we're learning, a release signed by the Director of Public Affairs, Stella Amwa, indicated the interdiction of Professor Ransford Yao Jampo and Dr. Paul Kwame Butako has become necessary to allow investigations into the sexual accusations against them. The statement said the two will be invited by the Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee in the next few days to assist with further investigations. The University of Ghana regulations from on actually frowns on sexual harassment involving lecturers which de de described as exploitation of power, imbalance and voicelessness with harmful impact on individuals, families and also institutions. Our statement assured the university will not shield any, anyone found culpable, adding anyone caught in wrongdoing shall be prosecuted. Meanwhile, additional communication lines have been provided by the university to enable victims of sexual abuse, harassment, and misconduct laws complaints uh, at the appropriate quarters. So that's what's happening with this particular one uh, there. And this is the, the information just coming through on this. Uh, so that's the information that we have with the latest one on that. So there's a lot of reactions to this. Uh, Professor, uh, that's uh, Jampo himself has been speaking about this and reacting to this particular latest uh, development. Well, I've been joined in studio by Professor Audrey Gajipo. She is a key member of this particular uh, team, that committee of the University of Ghana that's working on this and release a statement. Prof, it's good to have you as always. Good evening to you. Thank you and Fantastic. thank you for having you me. Stay with me a bit, Prof. Now, sure. I'm going to go on to Skype now and speak to Mayen Jones, who is the Nigeria correspondent for the BBC and the co actually the co-producer of this Sex for Greats uh, documentary, indeed, which captured the two uh, University of Ghana lecturers right there. And also, she's in charge of reacting to the the aftermath or the fallout of this particular documentary maya thank you for your time this, this evening and good evening to you uh, where you are in nigeria now first of all let me establish it kiki modi is saying that she started receiving death threats is it true and 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 who are these persons who are threatening her if you're aware uh, I'm not able to comment on that um, at the moment. Um, we don't comment on the reaction to our investigations. Obviously, the BBC's Africa Eye team has carried out a number of investigations around the continent, and every time they produce a strong reaction from the public. Um, but we stand by our journalism. Uh, we've done the research, and we're happy with what we've produced. But, but what informed the decision to, to zero in 
on the University of Ghana and on these two lecturers specifically? So Africa's Eye, Africa Eye's investigation took over a year to complete, and they spent nine months of that year uh, interviewing current and former students of the University of Lagos and the University of Ghana. And many of them had video footage, audio evidence, and the team sifted through all of that. And they decided to focus on those two universities, particularly because they had the strongest evidence that there was a problem of sexual harassment there. But then secondly, they chose the professors that they chose to focus on on the documentary because those were the professors where they had evidence that they could corroborate and, and get some background on that this had definitely happened. It was only after that research was carried out that they then decided to carry out secret filming to strengthen their case. But the BBC has very strong policy about when secret filming is allowed and lawyers and poli policy advisors uh, were spoken to before that decision was taken. That's pretty interesting. So you, you had some evidence prior to going into and also zeroing on this too. And this evidence, uh, in, in what form and from who? We interviewed over 60 uh, current and former students. We don't reveal our sources, so we can't give names. Um, but amongst those 60 current and former students that we spoke to, there were many people that had evidence about the professors we featured from the University of Lagos and the University of Ghana. I see. Now, there are many who have actually said that this has given enough grounds, for obviously, for some people who probably have suffered this to speak out. And then also those who are critiquing it also say that I mean, in an investigation like this, it's either you're going in and getting the person in the act to actually, you know, prove that, you know, you can get bad grades and go in and then have, you know, sex with a lecturer and then the, 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 the grades will be changed. What was the intent of, of this particular documentary? Was it to actually establish the intention or the real act itself? So what we wanted to show was that like what all the students had told us uh, before we carried out the secret filming, there was a problem of sexual harassment going on at both the University of Lagos and the University of Ghana. So the purpose of the investigation was to highlight this problem and provide the audience with evidence that this was going on. Many women before had tried to go forward to the authorities and, and claim that they had um, been harassed by the lecturers, but unfortunately they did not have evidence by themselves to be able to carry those cases forward, or a number of them say that their cases were dismissed by the university. So the purpose of this investigation was to bring together the investigative strength of the Africa I team with the evidence provided by um, the current and former students that it interviewed and try and bring forward a case to show that sexual harassment is prevalent in both of those universities. I will do this very quickly. Uh my, the, a, a minister of state in charge of tertiary education here in Ghana is saying that there appears to be some stereotyping in, in this whole re report and focusing on investors or investing in Ghana and putting it out in that particular light. So what's your reaction to this? Our intention was not to smear anybody. Our intention was not to ruin the reputation of everybody, anybody. As journalists, our role is to expose wrongdoing, to expose um, information that is uh, in the benefits of the public. And this is what we did with this investigation. They, we were told repeatedly by members of the public there was a problem of sexual harassment in both of those universities. We went and did thorough research and investigation, applying all the BBC's ethical standards, and we found evidence uh, that this was in indeed the case and that's what we put in the documentary. Would you agree with those who say that a critical analysis of the content of this is not in tandem with the title that you put out, Sex for Greats, that it doesn't really establish that? I think what we wanted, to, specifically with, in relation to the University of Ghana, it was very clear in our documentary that what we were trying to prove was that there was a problem of sexual harassment. We use the term sex for grades because it's a term that's well known um, in across West Africa um, for when it comes to um, sexual harassment of students by university professors. But what we wanted to show is that university professors were using their position of power and influence um, to sexually harass students. And the video evidence that we gathered and uh, the scripts that we put forward for this documentary does indeed prove this in our opinion. Thank you, Mayane.
Thank you so much for your time this evening. Extremely grateful. Mayani Jones is a Nigerian correspondent for the BBC. And as a matter of fact, she worked on this particular documentary with, with, with the team as well. And she is in charge of the fallouts of this particular uh, documentary, which is indeed uh, led to these decisions uh, as communicated to us by the University of Ghana. Professor Audrey Gadget posted with us in the studio, as I said earlier. So you, you had, you know, the, the basis yes. for this. Yes. Uh, they interacted with students, past and present. Mm -hmm. How widespread is, is this on, on the University of Ghana campus? I really don't know. But I think that when we watch the documentary, we begin to get a sense that we have a problem. The University of Ghana has always had, not, not always, but in, in recent years, has had a very robust anti-sexual harassment policy and has tried to adjudicate cases of sexual harassment, has educated its um, con community on sexual harassment, both students and faculty. But the evidence from BBC tells us that we have a lot more work to do. What work have you been doing? I mean, prior to this particular, okay. I, 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 w I want to assume that you you are aware of this. It, it, it probably wouldn't be the case that you well, were not aware that the, the sexual the, harassment the, the, that there goes were some on. Allegations of. Sure, I mean that's why we have an anti-sexual harassment committee. Right. So there's a committee in place, and the committee works all the time, and the committee has um, taken cases of sexual harassment against uh, faculty, students, and staff, okay? Right. So the committee looks at sexual harassment cases that are brought before it from the university community, and they've adjudicated and they've sanctioned. There's been some cases I understand you've dismissed some? some? Absolutely. So the university has dismissed some, some people, sanctioned some people, yes. I see, but this particular you know, uh, case involving uh, Professor um, Jampo. Did you know about this prior to the airing yesterday? No, I don't think so because no case had been brought before the Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee on Professor Jampo. We are hoping that this documentary will empower will empower victims of sexual harassment to come forward. Because one of the things that we call for and we struggle with is to get people to come before the committee and tell them their story. And that's why we now have taken measures. If you see our press release, we have um, set up a hotline and we've also set up uh, an email, and I, I, if with your kind permission, mm -hmm. I would really like to repeat the numbers for people to call us. Um, and the telephone number is 050 mm -hmm. 736 8053. The email is hearmystory at ug.edu.gh. We want to hear the stories so we can take action. I'm actually going to have you repeat that again and probably yes. put emphasis on it. But then, yes. uh, apart from this, I mean, is one thing actually putting out the number and is another thing having the students actually have the confidence and the trust to, to call and not have doubts about either their protection yeah or the identity is being hidden because yes. there have been cases where people have actually had to, you know, just keep this to themselves for right. fear of being victimized. Yes. And even sometimes when they have wanted to come forward and they've come forward, they've had peers or relatives tell them that, no, withdraw it, you know, because there's such a stigma in our society, not just in our, our university, but in our society about victims that are associated with sexual harassment. They're the victims, but somehow, you know, they are the ones who have to suffer the stigma, uh, uh, you know? And, and, and we, that's what I'm saying. We want to do more to assure students that they can come to us. As a matter of fact, I, I, I would want you to emphasize more on the, how they're going to be protected yes. if they actually come out to do this. The, the, again, the Sexual Harassment Committee is always very clear to read the rules to people, particularly the people, the, um, the complainant, they assure them that they will be protected and they will take measures to make sure that they don't suffer. It's up to them to, to believe the university, and some of them do believe the university and where they have 
cooperated with the anti-sexual harassment committee, there have been robust sanctions like dismissals. But they also send a clear signal to the, those alleged to have been perpetrators that under no circumstances should they try and victimize because if they do, the sanction will be even more severe. So we take a very dim view on, on that. And, and one of the things, and you know, we see this as a, uh, it, it's sad, um, but we, we, we hold on to the silver lining. And the silver lining is that people will come forward and tell us their story so that we can take steps. Because if people don't report to us, even if you hear a rumor, you can't act on a rumor. The university, therefore, is going to be having a series of debates with students to open themselves up to students, university management, and to get students to have more confidence that they will be protected. You repeat that number for me again. Yes. 050. 050-736-8053. 0 0 0 and the email, email very important, hear my story at ug.edu.gh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Too. Professor Audrey Gadjepo is a key member of this uh, particular uh, committee that uh, they, uh, sat on the, the aftermath of the uh, airing of this particular investigative piece by Africa Eye of the BBC and the decision as communicated to us by the introduction of the two professors captured in this video. But you're still live here on News 360. Now, vandals of the Commonwealth Hall of the University of Ghana uh, have issued seven days ultimatum to government to show commitment in addressing the accommodation challenge on campus. Uh, the aggrieved student's body saying that it would be compelled to embark on an intellectual walk if the demand remains unresolved after this particular ultimatum. Stanley Nibble who has more. Continuing students of Ghana's premier university in August this year became stranded after school authorities directed them to vacate their hostels so new entrants could occupy because existing structures could not accommodate the increasing students' population. The development, however, did not go down well with student bodies on campus. <laughs> A news conference attended by scores of aggrieved vandals of the Commonwealth Hall Tuesday morning, the students urged the university authorities to collaborate with other developing partners to address the pending accommodation challenge. They further demanded authorities to cede portion of its arable land to private investors to construct ample hostels before admission into the 2020-2021 academic year begins, else they will resist every attempt to displace them. We do not understand why management will be tempted to think that when there is accommodation issue on campus, the best alternative solution is to displace the current students who are bona fide stakeholders of the university and make provision for those who are yet to become members of the university. It beats our imagination and we want to strongly suggest to management that the university management should discard such a thought from the very conception stop, stop, stop. stage. Secretary of the Accommodation Good Crisis morning, Committee, Kweku Asante, is worried successive governments have not done enough to make students comfortable. The perennial accommodation crisis on the University of Ghana campus did not begin this academic year. It has been there for a long time. We are not waiting for next academic year when the universities admit 20,000 students and they have nowhere to sleep and the situation reaches an excessive crisis mode before we move on to the next level. And so we know that in this country, where there is the will, government can do something. Chairman of the Accommodation Crisis Committee, Bright Achu, said alleviating the concerns of the students should be the concern for all stakeholders. What we as students and members of the University of Ghana or Commonwealth are looking for is just structures to sleep in. Whoever comes to build it, it's not our problem. They have since threatened to embark on an intellectual walk after a week to press home their demand if authorities show no sign of resolving their concerns.
still on education, lecture halls at the Kumasi Technical University were deserted Tuesday morning following the strike by the Technical University Teachers Association of Ghana, TUTAC. Some students were unaware of the development, were at the lecture halls and couldn't, you know, um, help in educating themselves, while others also loitered. The strike is to press home demands for better conditions of service for TUTAC. They are also demanding the release of a staff audit report by the National Council for Tertiary Education. According to the association, staff of various technical universities are yet to receive their emoluments since the upgrading of eight polytechnics to university status. As a senior lecturer today, I still take 25 cities as rent allowance. I don't know where my employer expects me to be sleeping. Okay, and these are some of the issues that we have been referring to and over and over and over and again. And uh, we feel that government, as my general secretary said, over the years have not shown any commitment towards you know, migrating us or getting us you know, motivated enough to continue to do what we have been doing over the years. Acting SRC President Jennifer Japon is worried the strike would affect the academic calendar if the concerns of the teachers are not addressed immediately. We are appealing to the government to respond to what the tutor want them to do for us so that they will migrate them for them to be on the salary structure. Dean of Student Affairs said the academic calendar was disrupted two years ago due to a similar strike. Should this strike action continue, it is going to lead to the situation where the academic calendar is going to be disrupted um, students will adversely be affected. Tutak says it will only return to the lecture halls when the government resolves their grievances. General Secretary of the Kumasi Chapter, Dr. Smart Sapon, says they have given government ample time to address their concerns. Away from that, government has allocated 26 million cities for the construction of 10-kilometer roads in the Sunyani Township, including the new Doma Road and the Outer Bypass Ring Road. The sector minister, Kwesia Mwakwata, announced this on the first day of the tour of the president's two-day working visit in the Broome region. Here's a report by Larry Pa Moses. <laughs> President Ikufuado and his entourage were giving a rousing welcome by a group of nurses. The Junamhene Nanabofu Beni spokesperson for the chiefs commended the president for his social interventions like the free SHS, describing it as a great relief to the poor in society. He raised a litany of issues bordering on chieftaincy administration, poor roads, the upgrading of some Category A schools and the unattractive pricing of cashew produce craving the attention of the president for redress. President Kufaru assured traditional rulers that their concerns would be referred to parliament and the judicial council for redress. The president then visited the site where two new dormitories have been completed at the cost of 2.5 million cities and a 12-unit classroom block project at the cost of 1.6 million Ghana cities, which is almost complete. Kojokpo Nkrumah is the Minister for Information and he joins us via phone to continue this discussion. Thanks for your time, Ted. Can you tell us what the latest is with the president's tour? Well, the president just entered um, Winchi Township um, at the end of um, the Bono Regional Tour, which started, I think, as your reporter mentioned yesterday, from Sunyai uh, through Wemfie to Doma Hinko. And today, spent some time in Suma, Ahinko, uh, Jama North, Sampa, and ended in Banda. He just, as I'm speaking to you, literally entered Winchi Township. And essentially, he's been dealing with road issues. He's been dealing with education, he's been dealing with agriculture, and engaging with um, the chiefs and people across the Bono uh, region, updating them on the work he's doing and taking feedback um, on the outstanding work that needs to be done. Now let's move a bit away from that and talk about yesterday's demonstration by the law students. Now, government is not uh, happy about the way police handled you know, the law students with yesterday's demonstration. Has the president received the petition now? Um, we are in the Bono region, as I mentioned. The president will be in Accra by Tuesday morning. It is our understanding that the Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Godfrey Dami, received a copy of it, even though the second copy, which 
the deputy chief of staff was waiting to receive at the Jubilee House. They did not get there because of the uh, confusion that uh, ensued. But it is our expectation that the petition will be ferried to the office of the president uh, by the time he gets to Accra on Tuesday. The matters raised are matters that have been brought to his attention twice already, which he has ferried to the General Legal Council. Indeed, if you speak to the Law Students Association, they concede that some of the matters have already been resolved, but obviously they are still outstanding matters, and the president will be um, looking to uh, be seized with the issues they raise in this new petition and again engage the legally mandated body that's the General Legal Council um, to bring some redress to those issues. Thanks very much for your time, sir. Kojo Ponkuma is Minister for Information, giving us an update on the President's tour around the country. Up next is MTN Video Report. This is the current state of Kwe DA Primary. Kwe is a village under Nkwanta South Municipal in the Oti region. School has reopened. Now this is the current state of the classroom. You could imagine how the learners will go through to a decor for, for the authority concerned to come to the aid of these future Ghanaians. This is how the classrooms looks like. No furniture, sharing classroom with the animals, all the walls broken, everything has been Disorganized. This is your citizen journalist, Abdul Rahim Igwe, reporting from Kwe, Nkwanta South, Oti region. Just like our, you can also send your video report via MTN number 0551 433044. That's 0551 it's live here on News 360. Remember, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and on 3news.com. So stay with us. It's still News 360. Thanks for staying with us. A very good evening to you. Time for business with me, Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa, British diplomat and chief executive officer of the UK Africa Investment Summit, Paul Ackwright, says the UK will increase its investment in partnerships. He further admonished leaders on the continent to move beyond verbal commitment in the fight against corruption. He spoke in an interview with Alfredo Kanti. Chief Executive Officer of the UK Africa Investment Summit, Paul Thomas Arkwright, has affirmed their government's commitment to increase her investment in Ghana and ensure greater economic harmonization between the two countries, recounting the economic gains and significant strides aimed at formalizing and improving the Ghanaian economy in the last few years. Paul Arkwright said the UK is committed to bringing new investment and increasing existing UK investments in Ghana through partnerships. How we can bring together international institutions, governments and business um, under one umbrella uh, and make sure that there's some really practical, concrete uh, outcomes from the, from the summit. So we're going to look at uh, a number of key sectors. Um, certainly agriculture is one of them, manufacturing is another, and I know that those are two key sectors here in, in Ghana. Um, renewables, looking at the transition from oil and gas for energy into renewables, into solar, wind, hydro, etc. Uh, and we're looking at infrastructure. He appealed for an improvement in the fight against corruption since that could derail the developmental gains the continent has made. It's important to mention corruption and tackling corruption, which is really key to giving confidence to investors that when they invest uh, in Africa, that their investments are safe and that they can uh, get their money out if they need to, but they can also invest in confidence, with confidence, and ensure that there are jobs that are created. I have an experience of Nigeria, as you've said, and I do know some other countries where, uh, for example, in Ghana, where the president here is, uh, is very serious about tackling corruption. The UK will host the UK-Africa Investment Summit 2020 on 20th January 2020 in London. The summit will be hosted by the Prime Minister and will bring together businesses, government and international institutions and also help build a strong partnership between the UK and Africa for mutual prosperity. 
To some happenings now within the banking sector, Ecobank Ghana has celebrated the Ecobank Day. Now, the aim for this year's activities was to assist health sector workers to create awareness in reducing non communicable diseases, particularly breast cancer. The Ecobank Day, which is observed every year since 2013, has supported a number of institutions and individuals through education, health, among others. The Pan African Bank focuses its lenses on health for the past three years. This year, the bank pays attention on raising awareness on non communicable diseases, particularly breast cancer. An estimated 4,500 new cancer cases were diagnosed in Ghana last year with one-third being breast cancer. According to the World Health Organization, intake of tobacco and alcohol is among the biggest cause of all cancers worldwide. A representative of Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance, Labram Musa, called for tax increment on alcohol and tobacco. We are calling for tax increment on this commodity because, you see, once you increase the tax, you know, one, what that, uh, it, it, well, it reduces the burden. It also ensures that uh, the youth and the poor and the vulnerable and the marginalized in the society are not able to afford such commodities. I can tell you that uh, currently, as we speak now, um, the price of tobacco and alcohol are very cheap in the market. And these commodities are, are targeted at the youth and the vulnerable ones who are coming up. He stressed the ban on alcohol and tobacco advertisement could reduce cancer cases in the country. Managing Director of Ecobank Ghana, Daniel Saki, noted the bank will, for the next three years, support in reducing non-communicable diseases and their harmful effect on society. We at Ecobank are therefore excited to mention that for the next three years, starting from today, this will be our focus. And our attention will be turned on reducing the effect of NCDs and their consequent harmful impact on society. This will be under a three-year plan with a team preventing NCDs in African communities. With three sub-teams for each year, Ecobank Ghana is organizing this outreach program across five market centers. The Ecobank Day is celebrated annually on first Saturday of October across 33 affiliate countries globally. There's more business news on 3news.com. That will do for tonight. My name is Nana Ikea Mensa Brampa. Aisha is standing by. Thank you, Nanikia, for business. The Achime Bwakwa Traditional Council has launched the 20th anniversary of the instrument of the Ochehene Osajifu Amwetia of Repini. Now, several activities have been lined up for the three month celebration to be climaxed on December 21. The Ochehini Osajafo Amwetia of Oripeni was ensued on October 4th, 1999, as the 35th king of the Achim Abuakwa traditional area. He is recognized for his role in health, education, and advocacy on the environment. The Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs Minister, Samuel Kofi Jamesi, commended Ochehine for his mediation role in solving, in resolving chieftaincy disputes and his advocacy on the conservation of the environment. planting trees, I commend the Ochehine for bringing innovations such as planting of trees and the fight against illegal mining. The chairman of the anniversary committee, Nana Edusei Piasa, lauded Ochehine for his men's leadership role in bringing socio-economic development to the traditional area and beyond. He highlighted some educational and environmental projects to be initiated as part of the anniversary. university university the university built by the Ochehene has really helped a lot of people outside the town, but it's rather unfortunate that we the citizens do not realize the benefits of the university. The human resource executive of MTN, Aman Ponsa, who presented a check of 100,000 cities on behalf of the company, noted MTN shares similar interest in education, health and economic empowerment with Ochehine. The official cloth for the anniversary was also launched.
Hello, good evening, and it's time for us to bring you the latest in the world of sports. With me, Theo Inyan. Now, let's start with Wilfred Osei Palmer's appeal, you know, to his disqualification. Has been rejected by the normalization committee who say the disqualified GFA presidential aspirant submitted his documents after the deadline giving. The elections committee said in their letter to Osei Palmer on Friday, October 4, that the deadline uh, for any appeal was uh, Tuesday. Day, October 8. However, the Tema Youth President's legal team delivered the appeal at 4.50 p.m., 50 minutes late. When TV3 Sports caught up with a spokesperson from the team, he said the request for legal arguments from the vetting committee after a notice of appeal was delivered this morning delayed the process. What remains, though, is that until another step is taken, the confirmed aspirants are George Efriye, Ket Okreku, Nanaya Amponsa, Amanda Clinton, lawyer George Ankuma Mensa, and Fred Papo. Only six remain at the moment. All right, we're keeping a close eye on that. We definitely will be reporting every little development. Now, the road to a gold medal is a long one, but for the 28-year-old Richard Arthur, the road to it has been incredibly tough. With his excellent mind, competitive spirit, and brilliant work ethic, he believes he can reach the goal. He has a story of a paracyclist hoping that one day the stars will align uh, for him to hit his teeth on a shiny metal. A report by Daniel Yaboa. Along the streets of the capital, a cyclist paddles continuously. With his feet firmly on the paddle, a strong willpower and determination, he strolls along, riding up and down the undulating roads with a dream that one day he will cross the finish line of a major cycling tournament with a beaming smile. I be on the day uh, the good John trot bus like this. They think they are no get money. So if I enter the bus inside, they do sack me. So I tend to change my mind. Say I go bike a bicycle. So 2010, we are make serious of bike. We are go buy mountain bike. So when I bought the bicycle, I learned to ride it by following other people. Soon, I realized I am good at it. I can be a star for Ghana. 18 years ago, Richard Arthur lost one of his limbs in a motor accident while in a vehicle from Ijumakuba in the central region to Accra. Since then, he has had to fend for himself in many ways, including doing his house chores single-handedly. I feel shy to call somebody to come and help me sometimes because I feel they might abuse me. So I sat down to plan with an assumption that I have traveled to a different world. In the beginning, it was not easy, but now I feel it is easy for my body. Arthur may have lost one arm, but he has never lost the verve and drive about a career he is trying to hone ahead of him. He managed to secure a bicycle five years ago with the help of his friends and three times every week he rides a distance of 25 kilometers and is hopeful of becoming a Paralympic gold medalist in the near future. I know I have disability but the way I ride the bike I feel people with two hands cannot compete with me. Every year, there is a race outside Ghana, of which I tried and got the opportunity twice, but I couldn't attain. I have not traveled before, but if I get the opportunity, I can be the champion for Ghana. Arthur's major aim is to empower persons with disability across the country and the continent at large to take up their passion and with the right support and drive, their dreams can be realized. 
All right, moving on. Now, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, is calling for more funding to cater for the needs of refugees. Now, on the sidelines of the stepping for uh, safety walk in Accra, UNHCR country representative Esther Kiragu revealed Africa currently has the highest number of refugees in the world. Five million refugees globally with half of that number living in various refugees camp in Africa. However, funding support continues to dwindle. It is against this background that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is exploring other funding avenues. The Step In for Safety Work is among funding avenues the UNHCR is exploring to solicit funds from across Africa to cater for refugees in Africa. Right now we have the Venezuela situation and the donors are still the same. They will attend to the New West crisis, but we don't want to forget the ones that have been going on for long, which most of them in Africa. We have people who've been here for over 20 years and who cannot go back. We have to start appealing, especially here in the continent, that this is, the solution won't come from outside. It's an African issue, so we have to find an African solution to that. Country representative of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Esther Kiraku, outlined some of the projects that the UNHCR has invested in. We have built schools, by the way. We have built health centers. We have built police stations, fire stations, classrooms in refugee hosting areas to enable the hosting community to coexist so that they don't feel the refugees are taking you know, the quality away in education. Programs coordinator for the Ghana Refugee Board, Tete Padi, revealed the work is to drum home the fact that Ghana has refugees living amongst us. He encouraged citizens to support UNHCR to provide decent living conditions, including skills building, for refugees in Ghana. With the ongoing Lukulufu campaign, somebody can decide that every month I'll make a little contribution. And no amount is too small. Um, the, our focus these days is not just to give refugees food or money and uh, let them find something to eat. Our focus is to help them develop themselves so that they can feed themselves and their families and also contribute positively towards our economy. We have four refugee camps. Uh, three of them are Ivorian camps and one of them is a camp with a mixed population. He also applauded Ghana's policy on refugees, which he termed as being very welcoming to refugees. We are joining the fight to change the narrative. Okay, but before I go out of here, let me just update you on uh, what happened with the Black Queens earlier today. They played against Kenya and lost 1-0. I'll tell you the implications later at 9.30 p.m. when I bring you Sports Unlimited. My name is Thierry Nyan and I'll see you later. In entertainment news this evening, Nollywood contributes 1.42% of Nigeria's GDP, equivalent to $7.2 billion. Acclaimed filmmaker Ivan Kwashiga is optimistic the local movie industry also holds the potential to become a major foreign exchange earner when giving the enabling environment to thrive. He pushed for stronger policies to turn the fortunes of the industry around. Where do you mean now to Ghana movie industry. For me, I think that it is still a work in progress. We have potential to become a major foreign exchange earner for this country. Aside being a major contributor to Nigeria's GDP, Nollywood employs more than a million of Nigeria's population. The industry is touted as the country's second biggest source of jobs after agriculture. Seasoned Ghanaian filmmaker Ivan Kwashiga believes the fortunes of Ghana's industry could turn around when given the needed attention. The Kumawood film industry evolved out of nothing. No government putting money. It was the demand that was there. But because of the laxity in terms of the legal frameworks whereby we now have lots and lots of foreign productions like Mexican soaps that have been translated into local language somehow killed the Kumawood film industry. Considered one of the backbones of Ghana's film industry, Ivan Kwashiga called for the right policy framework to protect local content and ultimately help revamp the alien industry. If we had 
the legal framework or the environment, let's say there's a regime that says that we should show local con 70% local content, it would create the demand for local content. And by that, it would create employment for millions of young people who are going to be acting, who are going to be making the films, and those who will be distributing it and all that. So yeah, we need some regulation to control the kinds of content that our TV stations are putting out there. Ivan Kwashiga is positive. Aside creating employment and drastically reducing crime rates in the country, paying attention to the industry will put food on people's table, noting the multiplier effect will be tremendous. Uh, Nigeria did it and they are reaping the benefits now. Uh, why can't we do it in Ghana? The other thing too is equipment are very, very expensive if you want to make international quality films you need to use very expensive equipment. Now, if you bring these things in, you pay a lot of tax on them. And in Ghana, because we do not have a gear house where you can go and rent this equipment, most of our income goes into buying of equipment. Now, if there could be some tax rebate on equipment importation, that could help. There's hope, certainly. My name is Alfred Akonsi. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Thanks very much for watching. Do have a good evening.